Hello, microeconomists. Today we are in our very last video. We are looking at the practice session for the final exam. Let's start in part one, which has easy to moderate level questions. So the first question we're looking at is we're given this game here. We have two players, player one and player two. Player one here is shown in red and player two in blue. We're trying to find the dominant strategies in this game. So I'll start by looking at player one's perspective. So is A a dominant strategy? Well, if player two is playing little a, it's best to play big A. If player two is playing little b, then in that case, it's better to play big B. So A is not dominant. Big A is not dominant. Um, big B is also not dominant. That's because if player two is playing little a, it's better to play big A and get one than play big B and get zero. So I rule out big A and big B from being dominant strategies. Now perhaps player two has a dominant strategy. So is little a a dominant strategy for player two? So if player one's playing a, you can get three by playing little a. That's better than getting zero from playing little b. So if they play big a, you want to play little a. If they play big B, you can get zero by playing little a. However, you get one by playing little b. So little a is not always the best response. So little a is not dominant either. We showed that little b is also not dominant. That's because if player one plays big A, it's better to play little a and get three than play little b and get zero. So what's going on here is that actually neither player has a dominant strategy. So the correct answer would be F. All right, that's number one. So for number two, we can check each cell for the Nash equilibrium and see can either player gain by changing strategies. So let's start here with AA. If player one tries to switch, they get zero instead of getting one, that's worse. So player one does not want to switch from AA. Does player two want to switch from AA? Well, that would mean playing B, but B gets them zero and little a gets them three. So player two does not want to switch either. So because neither player wants to switch, AA is a Nash equilibrium. Now, don't be too hasty here. Don't circle option A yet. That's because there could be more than one Nash equilibrium. We gotta check the other possibilities. So is AB, big A, little b that is, is that a Nash equilibrium? Well, let's see, player one is currently getting two in this outcome. If they switch strategies and start playing big B instead, they would get four. So player one would want to change strategies. So this outcome here is not stable. So big A, little b is not a Nash equilibrium. How about big B, little b? So player one is currently getting four. If they switch to playing big A, they get two. That's worse, so player one does not want to switch. If player two switches, they get zero from playing little a instead of getting one from sticking with b. So player two does not want to switch either because neither player wants to change. Big b, little b is also a Nash equilibrium. All right, last possibility. What if player one plays big b 
and player two plays little a, so over here, and both players are getting zero, well, in that case, um, player one could switch to plane a and get one instead of zero. So one of the players wants to switch, this is not stable, and this is not an Nash equilibrium. So Lee and Nash equilibria are big A, little a, and big B, little b. So out of our options here, um, we choice E, more than one Nash equilibrium. All right, that's number two. Moving on, number three, we're trying to calculate the MPL. So we know the MPL is a change in total output. So output rises by 27 here. So it's going to be 27. Here, total output goes from 27 to 50. That's an increase of 23 because 27 plus 23 is 50. This last one being 20 because going from 50 to 70 and going from 50 to 70 is an increase of 20. So X is 23, that's choice B over here. So like I said, these are some of the easier questions in part one. All right, number four, why do you have a negative slope for labor demand? That comes from diminishing marginal returns. If you keep hiring more and more workers, then output goes up, but at a slower and slower rate. So the marginal price is diminishing, and the marginal profit being diminishing implies a negative slope for labor demand. All right, number five. Okay, so another easy one. Price discrimination disproportionately harms the poor. That is false. We actually saw many examples in chapter 11 where actually price discrimination helps the poor. Typically, though not always, typically the poor have a lower willingness to pay. As a result, the firm is gonna to try to charge them a lower price. Of course, they benefit from the lower price, so oftentimes price discrimination helps the poor. All right, number six, another question about price discrimination. So we have a monopoly on widgets. We can sell them to American firms or to foreign firms. So we have market power, that's one of the conditions, and we can distinguish different groups of customers. Another condition for having price discrimination be a possibility. However, firms can resell the widgets to other businesses. That's a problem. So I said one of our conditions for price discrimination is no resale. Otherwise, the people who pay a low price could buy up extra units and then resell them to the folks who'd be paying a higher price. As a result, you'll never sell goods for the higher price. So the answer here would be no because resale is possible. So you just type in C. All right, number seven. So we have three bundles, Q, R, and T. So we're looking at these preferences for Karen, and we're asking, is Karen going to be irrational? So rational means complete and transitive. Complete means you compare any two bundles and find out if one's better or if they're equally good. Karen is able to compare any two bundles, so her preferences are complete. Now I gotta check, are Karen's preferences transitive? So transitive says, if we have Q better than R, let's say I'm Q preferred to R, and R preferred to T, what that implies is Q preferred to T. But Karen's saying she thinks T is preferred to Q. So Karen's preferences are not transitive and therefore not rational. Now, local non-satiation here, that is a separate assumption. Local non-satiation is not part of rationality. Where we use local non-satiation, that was in our result that 
rationality plus this extra assumption plus local non-satiation gives you the law of demand with some exceptions. All right, number eight, the last in our easy section. So Peter has $1,000. With probability 90%, he gains 100. So probability 90%, he has a total of 1,100. And a 10% chance of losing 600. So if probability 10%, he'll have 1,000 minus 600, which is 400. We're trying to find his expected utility. Now, these first two options here are about expected value, so you can rule out A and B right away. Now, expected utility looks at the total amount of money he has, not whether it's a gain or a loss. So that would be choice C. So probably 90%, he has 1,100, he has some amount of utility from that. And it's probably 10%, he has 400. So C is right. Now choice D here is looking at the gain or the loss, ignoring the initial $1,000. That'd be more similar to prospect theory. No, not quite exactly prospect theory. With prospect theory, you would overweight unlikely events, so you'd inflate that 10% saying above 10%, and it also would underweight things that are likely, so that 90% would be treated as something less than 90% under prospect theory. So for expected utility, the answer here is C. So that wraps up the easy section. Let's look at the harder ones. All right, so labor supply is 15 plus L. The MPL is 20 minus L. Price of our good is $4. We're trying to find the equilibrium wage. So equilibrium means supply equals demand. We're given supply. Now we're going to find demand. So our demand was given by this condition, we said that the wage was equal to price times the marginal product of labor. And we had some intuition for why that was true. So we're told the price is $4, and we're told the marginal product of labor is 20 minus L. So that comes out to 80 minus 4L. So that's demand. So you combine, combine that with supply, which we said was W equals 15 plus L. So that gives us, we just sub out the W. 80 minus 4L is 15 plus L. So that means we can subtract 15 from both sides, which gives us 65. We can add 4L to both sides. 4L plus L is 5L. Divide both sides by 5, and we get um, 65 over 5 is 13. Now we're not done yet. It's about the equilibrium wage, not the equilibrium number of workers. To find the equilibrium wage, you can plug that in into the supply or demand. Doesn't matter because they're equal. Plug into supply or demand, and that'll give you the wage. So let's just do supply because that looks really easy. Supply is W equals 15 plus L, and we establish that L is 13. So that means that the wage is going to be 28. I'll give it a star for equilibrium wage. So look at our options here that correspond to option A, $28. So as you can see, in part two, the problems are a little bit harder. You got to do some extra work to first of all derive demand. And once you've got that, you find labor and only at the end 
defined weight. So more work than he had in the earlier section with the easier problems. All right, problem number two in part two in the harder section. So we have a monopoly on movie theaters and we have seniors and everyone else. The seniors have a lower willingness to pay and they're also more price sensitive. Mm -mm. So my marginal costs are eight and we're going to price discriminate. We're gonna charge a different price to each group here. So we know that for each group to maximize profit, you wanna have marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. We said earlier, we've gone over this a number of times that for marginal revenue, you have the same intercept as demand, but double the slope. So here intercept is 20, so that stays for the seniors. The slope is two. If you double that, now our slope is four. So that's marginal revenue. Set that equal to marginal cost. And likewise for everyone else, marginal revenue for everyone else is gonna be same intercept, 30, but then you double the slope. So instead of being a slope of minus one, now the slope is minus two. Then you set that equal to marginal costs. So if you rearrange, we're gonna have 12 equals 4q for the seniors, and then divide both sides by four, and you get q equals three for the seniors. You can then plug that back into their demand curve to find the price. So price is 20 minus 2q, but we know q is 3 for seniors. So you get 20 minus 6, which comes out to 14. So you want to charge your seniors $14. For everyone else, let's go and solve this. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Move the eight over here, and I get 22. With two Q the other side, you have a plus two Q. Divide both sides by two, and you get Q is 11. Now we're not done. We're trying to find the price you want to charge, not the quantity. So you plug that quantity into demand for everyone else. So price will be 30 minus Q, but we know Q is gonna be 11. So 30 minus 11 comes out to 19. So seniors should pay $14, everyone else should pay $19. That corresponds to choice D. So as you can see, once again, in the harder section, the problems require substantially more work than in the easier section. All right, that wraps up our practice session, and this will be the very last video of this course. Hope you guys stay safe out there and have the best of luck on the final exam. Goodbye.